Okay, so any questions from last week when we were covering some of the farm stuff? No questions at all. All right, so we're going to continue on. Um, all right, so we'll talk a little bit about receptor signaling. This will be useful, especially when we cover this in physiology as well. So you'll, you'll see some overlap. Um, basically, we, we mentioned that receptors are going to be these components. Uh, either the organism, you can have receptors that actually lie like on bacteria or in just specific cells uh, that, that our drug is going to be initiating with, uh, contact with, right? Initiate contact and then some sort of uh, secondary signaling will happen that leads to whatever physiologic effect uh, that we're expecting to see, right? So, um, the communication. Oh, yes. Okay, here we go. I can't find this PowerPoint. You can't find that PowerPoint? It's on the first PowerPoint. We didn't finish that whole section. Um, yeah, so I try to cut and paste my stuff together, and that way it's like kind of seamless. But you guys have broken that seam, so just kidding. You're fine. Okay, is everyone back together with me now? Okay, awesome. Fantastic. So uh, anyway, so basically, uh, the signaling that happens between cells um, requires molecules in a lot of cases, right? So we'll look at some of the ways that that can actually occur within the body. Um, you may find that uh, the products that are produced within one cell are going to be interacting with tissues of a completely different kind, right? Um, in order to, you know, some between like neurons to muscles and uh, between different like endocrine glands to different types of tissue. So um, there are a lot of diversity in the signaling molecules uh, and they can be transmitted in, in several different ways, which we'll look at in just a second. In some cases, you'll find that our drugs are trying to mimic some of these endogenous kind of uh, products your body would naturally produce. Some of them are going to be very synthetic and not actually look a lot like the endogenous product, but will actually still interact with those receptors in the same way. So uh, basically, the uh, receptor is going to be that portion that actually binds to the signal molecule, right? Whatever ligand will bind to that receptor uh, uh, that is going to be our receptor right there. Um, the effector is going to be whatever mechanism happens downstream from that, right? So it could be opening of a channel, it could be uh, changing transcription of genes, whatever the effector is, it's that kind of downstream process there. And we'll also look at secondary messengers, uh, which basically if you consider the drug or whatever ligand binding to that receptor being the first messenger, kind of the first point of contact, um, the secondary process that happens there are the second messengers. And we'll talk about a few different uh, versions of that. Uh, one way we can do uh, cell signaling is just going to be contact dependent. So basically the cells are going to be uh, basically kind of touching uh, directly in contact with one another. Um, you see this a lot, especially with the immune system. It's kind of how a lot of our immune cells kind of detect whether uh, cells that are coming in contact with their self or foreign, right? So if one of these, like, you know, say a T cell comes up and binds with a, a bacteria, it says, hey, this doesn't match any of my receptor sites. Let's go ahead and try to, to destroy this, right? So that would be kind of a contact dependent sort of cell signaling. You notice here the receptor, uh, and then whatever, uh, usually it's like a membrane-bound signal molecule um, that will be located within the cell membrane. Uh, we can have paracrine signaling. This is basically going to be where uh, some sort of molecule is being released from the kind of host cell. Uh, it's able to target cells that are relatively close to it. could be different tissue types, but uh, it's not really having to travel very, very far in order to get that cell signaling to, to occur there. But again, it's within the local vicinity. Uh, you can have synaptic transport. This is going to be good for kind of long distance transport, especially between this, uh, the nervous system uh, and to other tissues. So uh, can you guys think of any uh, particular examples where you can see this type of synaptic transmission occur? <clears throat> it's like skeletal muscle tissue is a really good one. That's how we initiate kind of movement, right? Think of any other ones? Also think about like your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. This is how this is also going to be working. Uh, whether we're releasing things like acetylcholine, that'll be a really important neurotransmitter. Um, you see things like epinephrine, norepinephrine being released here. So uh, lots of different varieties uh, that'll come out from the synaptic uh, transmission there. But uh, usually very specific and very targeted, right? Because you'll see that that uh, axon's gonna be traveling and be synapting to uh, a very particular type of tissue. Again, this could be very short distance uh, in some cases, it could be very long distance in others. And what do you call the, the molecules that we're kind of releasing here into the synapse? Neurotransmitters. neurotransmitters. So you guys think of any other examples of neurotransmitters? <laughs> Serotonin's a really big one, right? Yeah. Acetylcholine's a really good one. Dopamine. is a really good one. Dopamine's actually really, really good because that's where we get like our addiction pathway and our reward system. Everyone likes dopamine. <laughs> So you have other things like GABA. GABA is going to be a really important neurotransmitter. Glutamate will be another one. So we'll talk about those as we go, uh, go along uh, and discuss different neurotransmitters later on in class.
then you, another really important one is going to be endocrine signaling. This is going to be good for um, usually not instantaneous sort of signaling, but this is good for kind of long-term sustained kind of signaling between uh, cell types. So for instance, if you were to have, say, your adrenal glands release things like, you know, epinephrine into the bloodstream, uh, that's able to transport itself throughout the body and, and target different types of uh, uh, different cells. I think it's good for kind of long distance transport, uh, but again, may not be immediate because it's going to take time for the bloodstream to carry those uh, different hormones around. Or think about things like the thyroid gland releasing thyroid hormone into the bloodstream. Uh, those actually take a long time to actually have their effects. Um, we'll, we'll talk about why that is a little bit later. We'll get to the endocrine section of the video. Okay. Uh, we can also have enzymes being the targets for different molecules or, or drugs. And so you can see, um, for example, here we have a drug called, uh, we have two actually here listed. One is going to be 5 fluorouracil uh, which you can see here in this uh, top portion here, and then also methotrexate. Um, do you guys know where we use these drugs at? Hmm? Yeah, so methotrexate is a big one for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, I use it for a lot of kind of autoimmune conditions because it helps actually knock down the immune system. A lot of cases. Any other places? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so chemotherapy. Yeah, so both these drugs are actually considered chemotherapy because they help to target some of these um, immune cells. Kind of. So we use a lot of methotrexate uh, for like leukemia patients, especially over at Nemours. We have a, a lot of leukemia in, in children, and so we use a lot of methotrexate. But uh, basically what you see here is this process of uh, us being able to generate DNA based on uh, producing uh, uh, base pairs basically, right? So um, this is the process where we can actually recycle uh, folic acid. And so we utilize folic acid and eventually turn it into things like tetrahydrofolate. And then you can eventually get thymidine from this process here, right? So you have this thymidylate <coughs> synthase, which is an enzyme that 5 fluorouracil will actually will inhibit. So if you inhibit that process, you're not going to be able to get thymidine, right? So that can be an important thing. If you can't produce uh, new base pairs, guess what? You can't produce more DNA and then the cell dies eventually. Um, you'll find that methotrexate will end up in, uh, inhibiting this one called dihydrofolate reductase. Uh, and that also prevents recycling of uh, folic acid, right? So it's again, it's a normal thing that would come into our diet, but these drugs prevent the utilization of that, hopefully in more cancer cells than healthy cells. Uh, that depends on, on you know, a lot of factors, but basically uh, the enzymes can be the targets of, of some of these drugs. So again, you have to memorize how methotrexate methotrexate works specifically, just know that enzymes can be the target of medications. You guys have to memorize all that when we get to the cancer section uh, next semester. Okay, uh, we can also be targeting some transport proteins. So uh, this can be utilized for movement of lots of different molecules across the cell membrane, but ions uh, tend to be a very common target in a lot of cases. Um, so for instance, if we have like the sodium potassium ATPase pump, we will talk about this uh, extensively in physio uh, in the next section. Um, but basically this is a really, really important pump uh, that helps to regulate ions uh, between the outside and the inside of the cell and regulates uh, resting membrane potential, right? Uh, so it's important for things like the myocytes where they rely on action potentials to come along to initiate contraction uh, and so these uh, the sodium potassium ATPase pump is really useful for um, kind of resetting the whole process and getting, getting us back down to our resting membrane potential um, so you have to have this pump working in order to have um, you know kind of normal cardiac function you can actually have a drug something like digoxin you guys ever heard of that drug you guys know what you use it for use it for yeah, anyone know what type of rhythm is uh, some, yeah, so uh, we actually use it for like AFib. AFib is a very common place we'll use that for, atrial fibrillation. So usually for kind of supraventricular type of arrhythmias, um, we more often use it for things like congestive heart failure uh, so via some, some different mechanisms. But one of the big things that it does is it actually helps to inhibit this pump here. And so for instance, if you're having an arrhythmia, uh, by altering uh, the ability for that pump to work, you can just kind of change the set point for that cell and when it's going to be contracting. So if you make it more difficult for the cell to contract, uh, maybe that helps to prevent that arrhythmia because right in arrhythmia, your heart's probably beating too fast that can help to slow it down to some degree. So, um, but anyway, so this is where it would be actually targeting an ion channel versus uh, something like an enzyme or, or some other type of receptor. We can also be uh, targeting certain structural proteins. We mentioned uh, some of the microtubules that are important for things like cell division and whatnot. This can also be important in some other disease states. So, um, essentially, when you have uh, gout, which, what is gout? Build up of uric acid. Where's like the build up at? Uh, 
Yeah, we talk about the great toe uh, being one of the big uh, effector places. So um, essentially what happens with, with gout is you have too much uric acid uh, building up, in, especially like in the great toe, uh, and then you'll actually have a precipitation of these like kind of uric acid crystals. Um, one of the ways that we can actually combat that is by using a drug called colchicine. It's actually a very old drug, um, but basically it can inhibit these uh, these mitotic spindles, inhibit tubulin, uh, and basically it will lead to uh, improvement of symptoms by helping to, to relieve some of that, that stress down there in, the, in those um, tissues. Uh, but you can also see that, you know, if you were, had, were have too much colchicine around and you inhibit too many of these mitotic spindles that could prevent things like cell division so that could be a problem so that's why um, you see one of the big issues with colchicine is that you know if you had overdose of it you can end up having a lot of cell death occur because of that so it's important to make sure that we're staying within our appropriate dosing range uh, because you want to help the patient deal with their gout but you also don't want to kill off a bunch of healthy cells as well right so it's kind of a double-edged sword there Okay, so the main drug receptors that you'll be dealing with for the most part are going to be uh, either ion channels, look at G-protein coupled receptors, we're going to look at enzyme-linked receptors, and then intracellular receptors. So we're going to look at these four main types and see kind of where uh, some, some examples of how some of these work and, and how we can utilize these as drug targets. So uh, again, most of the ones we mentioned before are going to be the cell surface receptors. So particularly like the ion channels or G protein coupled uh, receptors, those are mainly going to be cell surface receptors, right? The drug only has to get as far as the cell membrane and they can have its physiologic effect. It never actually has to get within the cell itself in a lot of cases. On the other hand, uh, especially when you have like intracellular receptors, uh, these are mainly going to be on places like the, in the nucleus where you can actually affect gene transcription. You actually have to have drug that can make it into the cell in order to make it to the nucleus to have its effect. So when we talk about things like antibiotic resistance, we'll look at things where uh, if you have an intracellular receptor and the bacteria can do things like spit the drug back out of the cell, uh, the drug can't get to its, its target site and then it can't really have its effect and the bacteria keeps on growing. And so resistance will be a really important thing we talk about in both cancer uh, and also in, in uh, antibiotics when we get to that next semester. So uh, kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, and again, we mentioned for the cell surface receptors here, you have your ion link channels, G-protein, and the enzyme link receptors. Those are the most common cell surface receptors we'll deal with. Okay, so the ion channel linked receptors, these are going to be also known as ligand-gated ion channels or ionotropic receptors. Um, basically, this means that uh, they, when you have whatever ligand come in and bind the receptor, you're going to cause some sort of conformational change. Usually, it'll be that the, cell, uh, the transporter opens and will allow some influx of ions. Okay, so some good example of, of drugs that do this or certain ligands that do this will be neurotransmitters. So glutamate's a really big one. Uh, GABA. Um, where does GABA, where is GABA important within kind of like normal neurotransmission? Does anyone know what GABA does? Is that the downgrade one? Does it regulate Not really regulate pain so much. So, um, Think about GABA as being the brakes on your system, right? So if you think if you think about having like you're having a seizure, right? So if you're having a seizure right now, you'd be having too many uh, impulses happening within the brain, too many action potentials happening. It's a very unregulated kind of system. We can use GABA to shut all that down, slow everything down, right? So think about GABA as being the major brakes in the system. Uh, think about when you drink ethanol. GABA is a big player with with ethanol. That's why you get very sleepy after you even drink too much, right? Uh, as a side note, I saw some reports that DC bars were opening early today so that people could have watch parties for the Comey hearing, which I thought was pretty interesting. <laughs> anyway, um, so GABA is really important for that. And then glutamate, on the other hand, is going to be the flip side of that. Glutamate is a major, uh, the kind of a major excitatory neurotransmitter. Glutamate is very, uh, it can actually cause seizures if you had too much glutamate activity. Um, and so uh, think about those as being kind of two sides of the same coin. But basically, um, those are really important for, oh, yes, ma'am. Actually, yes. So um, gabapentin is a drug. Uh, do you guys ever heard of the drug gabapentin? Yeah. Neurotin is a brain name. Use it a lot for like uh, neuropathic pain. Uh, I see it a lot with like um, fibromyalgia and, and um, uh, different neuralgias and things like that. Um, that actually structurally looks a little bit like GABA. And so that's kind of where it got the name from. Um, but it actually doesn't do the same effects, which is confounding in a lot of ways. But that'll be more evident when we get to pharmacology. But yes, those are, those are structurally related uh, chemicals. Absolutely. Anywho, um, other things like acetylcholine, uh, serotonin, all these are really important for affecting these ion-gated uh, channels, right? So basically when they get affected, they'll open up a pore and will allow influx of different uh, molecules, right? So and again, do you think this would be going along the concentration gradient or against the concentration gradient? Against. 
this is actually going along the concentration gradient. This isn't really an active transporter pump like you would see. Uh, we'll talk about the sodium potassium ATPase pump, and that's actually an active transporter. This one is, is what we would call that facilitated diffusion, where you're going to have something bind that receptor, opens up the channel, and then it just kind of flows along its uh, uh, normal flow, right, from high concentration to low concentration. So again, this is facilitated diffusion at this point. Because again, normally those channels are closed. Normally the cell membrane would be impermeable <coughs> to flow those ions for the most part, uh, but when you have that uh, ligand coming to bind that, opens up, now you can have flow happen, okay? So for instance, it's really important, like I mentioned with the seizure example, uh, GABA allows for the influx of chloride. If I allow more chloride into the cell, it becomes more negative and it's harder for it to actually have an actual potential. So we can give drugs that bind those GABA uh, channels, opens it up, a bunch of chloride floods into the cell, and now it's really hard to, to activate that cell and the patient gets sleepy, right? Or they stop having a seizure, whatever it happens to be. Um, and usually the, the channels are going to be uh, selective for a particular type of uh, ion, right? So you can have sodium channels, you can have potassium channels. Um, some of them may be nonspecific, may allow uh, influx of different types of ions, but it just depends on, on the receptor you're dealing with. Okay. But again, these are going to flow according to their electrochemical gradient, not against it. You can see an example here where normally this would be uh, closed. You have the ligand coming to bind this, and now all of a sudden it's open, and it'll allow for free flow of the ions. Is this going to be a permanent kind of binding, do you think? It's going to always be bound there and always allow for influx? No, so it's going to be kind of uh, an equilibrium. We're going to have uh, some binding. The receptor, will, uh, the, the ligand will come off the receptor. It closes back up, and you can have rebinding happen again with another molecule, right? So this is kind of a, going to be an equilibrium uh, based on how much substrate you have around to bind those receptors and also how many receptors are there to be bound. Okay. Um, Looking at the structures, uh, it's like, how do you determine, like, which um, type of ion that a, a different, you know, uh, ion-gated channel is going to respond to? How do you determine what type of ligand that it's going to bind to? Well, a lot of it has to do with these subunits that are making up uh, these channels. So, essentially, you know, and again, you know, we look at usually these, uh, these cell membranes kind of from a 2D uh, kind of cross-section, and really these are 3D structures, right? So it has to make a pore, you know, circular in nature, uh, and so we use these different subunits. So based on things like if we have, say, two alphas, uh, a gamma, and a beta, that will lead to uh, chloride to flow through, and it binds to a GABA channel, versus if you have different types of uh, subunits, you may get something like a glutamate receptor that allows for influx of, say, potassium or something like that. Um, so just know that uh, the difference here is that... Um, these subunits can change, and this can be tissue dependent. It can be um, can be disease state dependent, and it will allow for different uh, effects, basically. Okay. And so you have a lot of different diversity uh, in these cases. So there's many variations based on the kind of subunit composition. Um, and so you think here, you know, most receptors have about five subunits uh, for these ion gated channels. Um, and oftentimes you can actually find that there's more than five different subtypes for different uh, like neurotransmitters, for instance. Um, so like serotonin is a really good example where we'll talk about serotonin uh, receptors and you'll find there's 5-HT1A, 2B, D, there's all kinds of different sub um, subheadings on a lot of those. So you have a lot of variation in those receptors um, based on their subunit composition, right? Um, a lot of this is gonna be dictated by things like which kind of gene products are being uh, made. And that, again, is gonna be regulated based on the tissue type that you have and what kind of promoters are available and, and things like that. Um, and so you can find that multiple combinations of these subunits combine to make uh, various types of functional receptors. Okay. So some good examples of this would be our nicotinic acetylcholine receptors. Can you guys think of anything else that binds to these type of receptors? Anything else? She said it. She said it very quiet. Nicotine. Yeah, nicotine. Yeah, so nicotine binds to the nicotinic receptors, right? Like I said, if it sounds like it's too much common sense, it probably is. So, um, right. So this is that's why we named that because we, you know, nicotine is one of the first substances we found that actually bound these receptors and then activated them. So uh, basically, you have nicotinic acetylcholine receptors uh, throughout the body, uh, very, uh, very ubiquitous in a lot of cases. And you can find there's different uh, subtypes of these. You can have an NM receptor and NN. Uh, these are going to act differently. Uh, NM major, major, mainly being on the skeletal muscle tissue and is excitatory. This helps to uh, actually allow for muscle contraction to occur, and this is important because it will increase permeability to sodium and potassium. That's how we get some of those action potentials started to initiate muscle contraction, right? Um, you can have some uh, nicotinic receptors on the autonomic ganglia. Again, these are also going to be excited toward this allows for synapsing uh, between uh, peripheral and central nervous system. And then also you can have some of these in the CNS as well. And notice how uh, even though they're all nicotinic receptors, they all bind acetylcholine. Um, they're going to have different effects on the, the permeability of different ions. So for instance, in the CNS one, this is going to be more calcium-based than in the skeletal muscle tissues, more sodium or potassium, right? 
So again, it's going to vary based on, on the tissue you're dealing with, where it's uh, residing within the body, and what type of subtype of receptor you're dealing with. Okay? You don't have to memorize these examples, just know that there's going to be variability there. Okay. Um, other good ones, uh, good examples. Uh, curare is a, is a kind of an old molecule. This helps us to um, deter or at least develop a lot of the paralytics that we use nowadays that we can use when you're trying to intubate somebody or if someone's going down for surgery. Um, curare actually comes from um, uh, you ever hear like poison dart frogs, right? So that curare is actually a molecule that they produce uh, where the indigenous peoples, wherever they uh, were, were living at, um, they could actually use some of this curare off of the frogs and, and put on these darts and they can use that to uh, paralyze uh, either animals or, or people they might have been shooting those darts at. Hopefully not people, but who knows. Um, other drugs are things like barbiturates. You guys think of any examples of barbiturates? You guys ever heard of that class of drugs? So you ever heard of uh, phenobarbital? It's a kind of a very old drug, but it's considered a barbiturate. It's a, they're old school sedatives, essentially. Um, barbiturates are also the type of drug they use when they do lethal injections. Um, but basically, they, they also work through the GABA receptors, and they allow for increased um, sensitivity to the neurotransmitter GABA and allow for better influx of, of chloride. So um, calcium channels are really, really important for the cardiovascular system, uh, specifically certain subtypes of those receptors. And so by giving calcium channel blocking compounds, by preventing calcium from being influxed into those cells, you can see that we can do things like lower blood pressure or relieve chest pain. Um, so if you ever heard of like deltiazem or verapamil, like those are uh, calcium channel blockers that we can use um, to help slow down the heart, really, uh, you know, kind of lower the blood pressure uh, by blocking calcium influx into those cells. And so um, lots of other things, insomnia, anxiety, depression, schizophrenia, all can be affected by these channels as well. We'll get into all of those uh, in more detail when we get to actual pharmacology. Okay, so those are the ion-gated channels. Uh, next, moving on, we have the G-protein coupled receptors. Uh, basic, this is the same basic structure you're going to find for all G-proteins. Essentially, what you're going to find is they're going to have uh, some sort of receptor binding site, which you can see kind of more detail here, and they're going to have these seven transmembrane-spanning uh, protein segments. Okay, Again, it's all kind of one big long chain that sits here right within the cell membrane uh, and allows for a lot of different types of cell signaling to occur. But basically, here's where the receptor is going to bind uh, to whatever molecule it's, uh, you know, it's uh, coded for, and then we're going to have some downstream effects that occur secondary to this. This is one of those secondary messenger systems we're going to talk about in more detail in a few minutes. But there are a ton of G proteins, and they're super important, especially for things like the sense of smell or taste. Um, G proteins are going to be very, very prominent there. Um, we have thousands of different varieties, even for just smell alone, and we'll look at those in more detail when we get to the sensory uh, lectures over in, uh, in physiology. Um, but you can find that they uh, respond to a variety of different uh, neurotransmitters, uh, hormones, uh, amino acids, even like, you know, so lots of different things that they can respond to. So it's pretty um, diverse group of, of proteins that can uh, lead to all sorts of different physiologic effects. And about half of the known drugs that we have are probably going to be working through G-protein linked receptors. Okay, so it's very, very important for, for drug action. And again, um, we're going to have the extracellular. Uh, this is where the actual ligand is going to be binding to the receptor uh, portion of this. And then we're going to have the downstream effect that occurs here within the cytosol. Okay, but they're always going to have this kind of seven transmembrane spanning uh, portions here. Okay, so usually what we end up finding uh, is that you will have uh, receptor proteins. Uh, they're lying. Let me use my laser pointer. Uh, essentially, what we have is you're going to have the receptor molecule here, and then you'll have these inactive G proteins. This is an example of a secondary messenger. Okay. Um, essentially, what you're going to be having is once we have uh, the receptor protein being activated by whatever ligand happens to be, you're going to have it uh, reacting here. This will cause an activation of these G proteins, right? Because normally this is in the kind of a dormant state. Notice here we have guanosine diphosphate. It's going to be kind of working similar to like the uh, adenosine triphosphate, which I mentioned is going to be um, you know a major kind of energy carrier. So essentially what happens is uh, you're going to have GDP kind of sitting here uh, in the inactive state, and then we can actually phosphorylate that to produce GTP, which is going to be the much more active state, right? Because as another phosphate bond, it has a lot of energy uh, contained within that. Um, once that occurs, you're going to have an activation of this complex, and then you can have further downstream effects. So you can have different enzymes being activated by these subunits. You can have um, maybe changes in nuclear uh, transcription, translation. All kinds of different things can happen secondary to this activation of those G proteins, okay? And as long as the receptor is being bound by this, the it's going to be an active protein, right? Those G proteins are going to stay active and kind of doing what they do until the receptor comes off of it, and then they can kind of go back to this resting conformation. Everyone with me so far? Okay. Um, 
Again, so uh, some of the downstream things that can actually happen. Uh, secondary to this, you can see that the, uh, this active alpha subunit uh, combined to a different target protein. Um, in a lot of cases, you're going to find that uh, adenylate cyclase is going to be a very important enzyme, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, but essentially, uh, what happens is you're going to have, uh, and again, uh, one of these activated G proteins, they don't just go and activate one target, right? Uh, we like to see much more of kind of a cascade kind of effect where this alpha subunit can go and affect multiple targets. Right. As long as that receptor is being bound, uh, it's still going to stay in an active state and go and bind lots of different things and cause lots of, uh, of its effect. But essentially, the way we get back to the resting conformation of the inactive state is we're eventually going to have hydrolysis of that GTP. And eventually the alpha, uh, phosphate group is going to come off of that. We're going to have GDP at that point, and it's going to kind of come by, uh, combine with the other subunits and you're going to have uh, back to the resting state, essentially. Okay. So um, usually this is going to be a very slow process to hydrolyze that GTP. So it could be, you know, if you don't have the proper enzymes to cause the hydrolysis, it could stay active for a really long time, which may lead to kind of more dramatic physiologic effects than we want. But um, by having a specific GTP ACE kind of enzymes, uh, we're able to catalyze that a lot more quickly and get back to an inactive state, kind of reset the whole process and allow for another drug or molecule to come bind that receptor and start the process all over again. So some good examples of G proteins, and again, don't uh, memorize this whole list. This will uh, be more important when we come up to specific examples kind of later classes or sections. Um, but just to give you some examples of things that happen, a um, good example would be the GS protein. Notice there's lots of subunits. So again, they're not all going to be identical. The Structurally, they are identical, but they can have different target uh, molecules. Different um, actions are going to happen downstream of that. So, for instance, uh, the beta adrenergic amine. So, think about like epinephrine, norepinephrine, they bind to beta uh, receptors. Then you can see uh, basically adenyl cyclase being activated here. That increases cyclic AMP, uh, which we'll again talk about in a little bit more detail a little later on. Uh, but that can cause things like increasing heart rate can increase your blood pressure, uh, all kinds of effects like that. Glucagon works through this pathway, histamine, um, lots of different uh, kind of endogenous um, ligands. Um, you can see things like this uh, this golf protein, uh, lots of odorants are within the olfactory epithelium. That's where we get a lot of different senses of smell uh, that come about from these different G proteins that happen there. Um, and you'll also see uh, some other secondary messengers that get affected by this. So cyclic AMP is going to be a big one, um, but you can also have things like phospholipase C, which we'll cover uh, a little bit later. Okay. Um, so uh, next, moving on, we'll have enzyme length receptors. So we talk about G proteins uh, and how they, they kind of work. Next, uh, another common one we're going to have is going to be enzyme linked receptors. Um, Typically, it's going to be pretty slow, but really, um, there are, are several subtypes we're going to see used, and these aren't really going to be as popular for drug targets, but they're becoming more popular, especially with certain disease states like cancer and things like that. So we can target some of these different um, uh, enzyme-linked receptors. We're actually getting a lot better uh, kind of specificity for different disease states and a lot better outcomes uh, for them. Um, the most uh, important one that we're going to be dealing with is going to be tyrosine kinase. It's going to be the most important uh, enzyme-linked receptor, and the one we're going to look at in more detail uh, here and, and to see how that actually works. But just know there are other ones that are out there, um, but uh, the tyrosine kinase is the most important one. A picture of how that works in just a second. Um, we'll also see that things like DNA synthesis, cell proliferation um, are all going to be really important uh, targets for this. And you can see why this would be important for things like cancer treatment, right? So for instance, if I have a tyrosine kinase uh, receptor um, affecting cell proliferation, we said cancer is kind of unchecked cell proliferation. If I can target this receptor and shut it down, potentially I can start, stop, you know, cancer's growth of cells. You know, so you can kind of think about some of the different targets and how this might be useful for different types of diseases. So here's an example of what one of these looks like. Normally, you're going to have kind of two subunits for these tyrosine kinase receptors. Uh, again, it's going to require two signal molecules to bind to both of these. Once that binding occurs, you're going to see that they actually come together, and you're going to have a phosphorylation. This is an active process that requires ATP. It's going to phosphorylate these uh, tyrosine uh, molecules here, uh, and then that will lead to whatever cellular response. So whether it's uh, causing further cell proliferation or if it's to, um, you know, having to do with insulin receptors, whatever happens to be, um, it's going to have whatever downstream effect after that phosphorylation occurs. And then finally, you have your intracellular receptors. Um, basically, these are molecules that have to get into the cell somehow, so either through passive diffusion or if they're going to be going through some sort of uh, facilitated diffusion, uh, you know, through some sort of carrier molecule, something like that. Um, but think about things like steroids. be really important here. Uh, can you guys think of any examples of steroids? Estrogen. Estrogen's a really good one. Cortisol. You also call it hydrocortisone is another name for that. 
yeah, testosterone, progesterone, yeah. So these are all hormones that we can be giving, especially, and I'm thinking from a drug standpoint because we can give all of those exogenously. Um, they have to get down to the, the actual nucleus to change gene transcription. And so it has to be able to get into the cell. And if it can't do that, then it's not really going to be all that effective. But uh, basically the, the actual receptor act, uh, part of it is going to be within the cell somewhere. Uh, so just know that it doesn't really act on the cell surface. It has to get in to be effective. Okay. Um, so some good examples, uh, we mentioned cortisol, uh, estradiol, which is an estrogen uh, uh, hormone, thyroxin, which is going to be important for thyroid function, uh, testosterone, so we mentioned all of these, uh, but basically by coming and binding some sort of uh, ligand within the actual uh, nucleus, uh, you can change uh, some of these transcription uh, products. So either, you know, for instance, if you're um, binding to, say, estrogen receptors, uh, that can cause you know changes in ovulation, or it can change cause uh, changes in, in um, you know, menses and things like that. Uh, but basically, all those changes have to occur within the nucleus. So once the, the hormone comes and it binds this, then it can change whatever target it is. Okay? You can actually have some things that will be inhibitors of this as well. So for instance, um, certain uh, drugs we can use for, like breast cancer can actually work as an antagonist at the estrogen receptors, and so they'll basically come in and bind this and prevent actual activation from occurring. And then you would have say like less breast uh, tissue development. Right, because you have breast cancer, there's too much of that breast tissue that's developing. If you can block that, some of these drugs, that same thing, uh, you can basically you know prevent uh, further tissue from developing. Right. So again, we'll get into more detail on all these uh, more specific examples later on in pharmacology. I'm just trying to whet your appetite a little bit, so you guys are really excited for farm when it comes around. Right. <laughs> Okay. So anyway, so these are the four main receptor types we're going to be, uh, you know, we'll continue to talk about uh, when we get to specific drug examples. Any questions on how any of these work? All right. So continuing on. Yes. For the G protein receptors, you said that the actual G protein is the secondary messenger, not like camp or. Um, that yeah, you're right. So basically, the, the first messenger is going to be the thing that binds to the actual receptor portion, mm -hmm. right? Um, the G protein, then when it activates those different subunits, it'll affect either adenylate cyclase, which would be your, your actual secondary messenger, or like IP3 or different things like that. So we'll, we'll look at those um, in more detail in the, in the next upcoming slides. Yes, you're right. But you like conceptually, like when you think about them, um, you'll think about the G protein as like activating the second messenger, and so they kind of become synonymous, right? Unless you had that G protein being activated, like the secondary messenger is kind of not important because it never gets activated at that point. Yeah. So you'll kind of end up thinking about them um, kind of synonymously. But I'm not going to ask like a question like, which one of these is a secondary messenger? G protein, tyrosine kinase receptor, or adenylate cyclase. Like that's not really kind of what I want you guys to get out of this, but I might say like, um, let me think, it's a good question. I like to think of like example, like test questions, so I at least give you guys an idea what, what might come up on the exam. I might say like, hmm? what'd you say? No, I wouldn't even ask uh, something like that because I, I don't really care that you guys can like regurgitate like basic facts. Uh, I like to know like more conceptual stuff. So, for instance, if I said, you know, this enzyme uh, binds to adenylate cyclase, uh, if I were to inhibit this, what could be the downstream effects, right? And so I may say like decreased production of cyclic AMP, um, decreased uh, production of cyclic GMP. You know, so you'd have to know, okay, I know what adenylate cyclase is. I know if I inhibit that process, I'm going to have less of adenylate uh, cyclic AMP. All right, so there's kind of the multi kind of step process that I'm going to. To ask you guys about. We'll have a review beforehand, which will have more concrete examples. I'm just kind of thinking off the top of my head. Okay. The test is not just off the top of my head. I put a lot of thought into those. Do we get very freaked out by this exam? But I've never had anyone fail pharmacodynamics ever. So you guys will not be the first, as I mentioned. Uh, and we're going to go into more detail on the secondary messenger uh, system here, and then we're also going to talk about dose-response relationships. So getting kind of into more of the nitty-gritty of what happens when the actual drug's in the body and what happens to people. Okay, so, um, we mentioned that uh, molecules bind usually to the cell surface, sometimes they'll actually be within the cell itself, um, and then activate these kind of secondary messenger pathways. So the most common ones we'll deal with are going to be cyclic AMP, or cyclic adenosine monophosphate, uh, cyclic GMP, and then also calcium is going to be another really, really important one uh, for causing all sorts of different physiologic processes, right? So calcium is super, super important. Um, and so these can either be activated by things like opening of ion channels. So we mentioned, you know, not only can like G proteins go and activate some of these uh, different enzymes, but you can also see things like, well, if I increase the calcium influx into the cell, that can also activate them. Or if I have something like, you know, closing of a sodium channel, that might activate them. So lots of different influences um, can go into uh, activation of these secondary messengers, not just G proteins, not just tyrosine uh, kinase receptors, lots of different things can.
So the first one we'll mention is going to be cyclic AMP. Uh, and so this is going to be generated from mm -hmm. ATP through the adenylate cyclase enzyme. Adenylate cyclase is going to affect ATP, and then we'll end up getting cyclic AMP that's going to be made out of that. And so you can see that uh, cyclic AMP is really important for targeting protein kinases, uh, which will end up causing lots of different processes to occur kind of downstream from that. So good examples of things that work through cyclic AMP include uh, adrenocorticotropic uh, mm -hmm. hormone, right? So ACTH, and you know, really important for like stress response, which we'll talk about in the endocrine section of uh, physiology. Glucagon works through cyclic AMP as well, which we said glucagon does what? It causes glycogenolysis, causes gluconeogenesis to raise blood sugar. Um, uh, thyroid stimulating hormone, which is important for obviously stimulating thyroid. Uh, and then also things like vasopressin, um, all, otherwise known as antidiuretic hormone. All those can work through cyclic AMP um, to cause their, their secondary effects or kind of downstream physiologic effects. So when this occurs, uh, again, uh, say if you have a hormone that comes along and binds, uh, you'll end up having a hormone bind to the, the G protein that'll cause that uh, activation of GDP into GTP, which will activate the G proteins themselves. Now, once that occurs, then you're gonna have activation of adenylate cyclase. Again, right here, this one's uh, embedded within the, uh, the lipid bilayer. It doesn't have to be, it can be um, located within the actual cytoplasm itself. This is just for this example. Um, but adenylate cyclase will end up converting ATP over to cyclic AMP. Okay, so this is kind of the, the actual uh, process here uh, where cyclic AMP is made. And then we can go along and start to act activate some of these protein kinases. So uh, once we have an active protein kinase, it can target lots of different things. So you may see, um, you know, stimulation of secretion of certain uh, cellular components, right? Uh, it could cause ion channels to open. It could cause gene transcription to differ. Um, whatever type of downstream effect it's going to have is activated by these protein kinases. Okay. Some other examples uh, that uh, work this way, um, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, which are really important for like sex steroids. Um, uh, PTH or parathyroid hormone, which is important for um, calcium homeostasis and, and, and osteoporosis, which we'll see. Uh, and calcitonin, which is kind of the, the flip side to, to PTH. You know, we'll get into more detail on these later. So uh, another example where we would have activation of cyclic AMP uh, or formation of cyclic AMP activating these protein kinases. Once these are activated, they can actually, uh, in some examples, go down to the nucleus and they could actually change gene transcriptions. Maybe a new protein is being made or more of a protein or less of a protein, whatever it happens to be, um, that change can happen there right there in the nucleus uh, once those protein kinases are activated. So I would mention uh, glucagon is really important for this. It helps to liberate uh, glycogen into new glucose to go into the bloodstream. Um, antidiuretic hormones are really, really important um, for controlling the osmolarity of the blood, as we'll see. So again, if, you're, uh, if you have too much, um, you know, if your, your blood is too concentrated, if you've lost too many fluids, you can in, uh, end up secreting antidiuretic hormone to hold on to more fluid. Um, calcium homeostasis, as I mentioned, and then also this is really important for things like uh, force of contraction of the heart and also uh, constriction of the, the um, blood vessels. So regulating things like heart rate, cardiac output, blood uh, pressure is also regulated through cyclic AMP as well. What's actually kind of cool is, for instance, um, from my tox standpoint, uh, for instance, if I have a, a patient who overdosed on a drug that blocked one of these receptor pathways, right? Um, so say, for instance, someone who overdosed on a beta blocker, right? So if you think about propranolol or things like that, uh, basically they're blocking those beta receptors and they can't activate cyclic AMP and the heart starts to slow down, can't really beat as hard and the patient's going to get hypotensive and they may potentially, you know, stop perfusing well and they die. We want to avoid that. We can actually use backdoor drugs in order to actually stimulate cyclic AMP to increase concentrations of it and to get the heart beating harder again. So one of the things we actually do is if you have someone who has all their beta receptors on the heart block, we can actually give glucagon. Give glucagon and that actually stimulates cyclic AMP formation within the heart cells themselves. And that can actually in increase the, the force of contraction of the heart and actually increase perfusion. So it's one of those things where you don't think about using glucagon. You normally think about giving for hypoglycemia. We'll actually give for beta blocker overdose to help raise a patient's blood pressure and, and heart rate. So using our knowledge of secondary messengers to the patient's benefit, right? That's what it's all about. So uh, another uh, good example of this would be uh, epinephrine affecting uh, glucose formations. We mentioned that not just like glucagon causes things like glycogenolysis, but also uh, some of our kind of stress hormones or things like epinephrine, uh, which may be like released from the uh, the adrenal glands. You can see activating here the receptor, activating our G proteins, and then generally cyclase gets activated. So cyclic AMP is going to end up uh, causing these protein kinases to be activated, and then we're going to see breakdown of uh, our glucose, we're going to uh, our glycogen to end up getting glucose 6-phosphate. 
and then eventually we can release that into the bloodstream for your fight or flight response. Okay, so just realize that you can have different molecules that can activate the same kind of processes, uh, even though they happen to all be through you know, maybe adenylate cyclase or whatever secondary messenger we have. Everyone with me so far? Uh, another good place would be the kidneys, uh, where we can actually have things like antidiuretic hormone actually working here. Um, so, for instance, if we would like to have, uh, say, more uh, retention of water, right? We want to hold on to more water, we want to reabsorb more water that enters the nephron. Um, you can do things that have like, antidiuretic hormone that helps to put uh, those aquaporin channels within the, the tubule. By having those aquaporins inserted in, which gets activated by adenylate cyclase uh, and cyclic AMP, you can have more reabsorption of water, okay? Which is a good thing for us. Um, because you know why you get so dehydrated like when you drink too much alcohol? It actually shuts down production of antidiuretic hormone, which makes you pee a lot. That's why you don't want to break the seal when you're drinking, right? Mm -hmm. You have to go to the bathroom all the time. It's because you have uh, basically the ethanol shutting down the production of antidiuretic hormone, and you're releasing too much water through the kidneys, and thus you get a uh, hangover the next day because you're all dehydrated. One of the reasons you uh, have a hangover. Uh, and again, uh, going back to the heart example we mentioned, so if you have like your sympathetic nerve terminal, normally releasing things like norepinephrine uh, into the synapse, it can activate those beta adrenergic receptors, that's what that is here, and lead to activation of cyclic AMP. Okay, uh, so we end up having uh, this cause protein kinase to uh, be activated, and this actually opens up calcium channels. I mentioned calcium is really, really important for muscular contractions, and so if you have more calcium within the heart cells, it's going to be harder. Okay, and that's one way we can uh, um, utilize our, our fight or flight response to increase cardiac output. Uh, another good uh, secondary messenger is going to be cyclic GMP, uh, and this is going to be activated by guanylate cyclase. So you can kind of think of uh, adenylate cyclase and guanylate cyclase working similar to one another, but the physiologic effects they have are going to be uh, different. Um, so again, cyclic GMP also regulates a different set of protein kinases. Uh, we see this working a lot in some of the intestinal mucosa. It helps to kind of control ion channel conductance. So again, uh, electrolyte flow within the GI tract is really important because if you lose too many electrolytes, uh, can cause some problems. You know, uh, if you're, you know, having really bad diarrhea or something, uh, if you have too little, that can also be problematic. <clears throat> One of the main things we use drugs for to affect this is going to be uh, affecting vascular smooth muscle. And so, look at a drug that affects that very specifically called nitroglycerin, which I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with. Uh, but basically, we can use these to help uh, affect vasodilation and increase blood flow to certain tissues. So um, imagine this being kind of a smooth muscle cell, say, uh, along the, the vascular endothelium. Um, you can have a agonist bind to uh, the stress receptor here that's going to activate guanylate cyclase. We're going to get GTP, as I mentioned, gets converted over to cyclic GMP, and which can cause things like uh, some of these ion channels to open up. Um, you can see other protein kinases being affected here. Um, what's interesting is, uh, have you guys ever heard of this drug, sildenafil? Does anyone know what that is? I told you the brain name was Viagra. Yeah, so Viagra is used for normally what? Mm -hmm. Yep. So it's usually used for erectile dysfunction. And actually what you end up seeing is that the um, in order to prevent too much cyclic GMP from floating around, this is regulated by a, a molecule called phosphodiesterase. And so if you have phosphodiesterase goes along and it actually um, metabolizes the cyclic GMP back to GMP, which can then be further recycled, right? Um, so you can actually give drugs that inhibit this process and will lead to less phosphodesterase activity, so that way you have more cyclic GMP around. More cyclic GMP leads to more uh, smooth muscle relaxation, and it can lead to uh, lots of good effects. So for instance, um, a lot of people think it's weird when I give little girls Viagra. Like, Why would you ever give a little girl Viagra? It's like, well, I'm trying to relax them with the smooth muscle, not necessarily uh, for any of our sex organs, but we can use it in the lungs, because phosphodesterase is also really important uh, up in the lungs, and if I can inhibit that, I can cause uh, a condition called pulmonary hypertension to improve. By relaxing some of that smooth muscle, I can allow for better blood flow through the lungs, better oxygenation, and better outcomes for the patient. So we do that very frequently for a lot of our cardiac kids. Um, so if you ever see like a little boy or a little girl who's on Viagra, uh, or something like Cialis or something, that's usually what it is, is for their pulmonary hypertension. So again, using these kind of biochemical uh, pathways uh, for different types of disease states and maybe what you would originally expect. <clears throat> 
Um, so uh, otherwise, you can see this is um, another a good way that our body regulates uh, blood pressure, especially causing vasodilation, is through nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is really important for activating uh, not only guanylate synthase or guanylate cyclase, I'm sorry, uh, but also can affect things like prostacyclin formation. So PGI2 is also known as prostacyclin, uh, which can affect uh, dilate cyclase as well. So kind of both these pathways uh, can work to increase vasodilation and lower things like blood pressure or lower pulmonary uh, pressure uh, by by uh, going about this. And so where this comes into play, especially is when we talk about nitroglycerin, right? So nitroglycerin mainly used for, yeah, chest pain, angina. We use it when you're having uh, signs of myocardial ischemia, right? So if you're having uh, not enough uh, oxygen getting to the heart tissue, tissue starts to die off, we get chest pain, right? So essentially what we do is use nitroglycerin, which actually gets converted over to nitric oxide which can then, once it gets into the uh, smooth muscle, especially on the vascular system, activates guanylate cyclase, we get more cyclic GMP, that is gonna cause smooth muscle relaxation, and thus you're gonna have more blood flow to the heart, and now that tissue is gonna be uh, relieved, and you're gonna have relief of chest pain, okay? So again, you see how these secondary messengers are kind of uh, being influenced in lots of different um, uh, drugs we can use. This is also why they tell you not to use things like sildenafil along with nitroglycerin because it can actually, when you have synergy there, so if I were to give uh, a drug that increases nitric oxide, which increases cyclic GMP, and then I give another drug that prevents breakdown of cyclic GMP, way too much vasodilation, you can have really bad blood pressure drops, right? So really bad hypotension that can happen uh, from that. So again, understanding the mechanisms here, you can understand drug-drug interactions, you can understand contraindications, and uh, better ways to counsel your patients, like, hey, don't take this drug with this drug, because it can lead to bad outcomes, or whatever it happens to be, right? Uh, so important things to remember. All right, uh, we mentioned calcium is a really important signaling molecule. Uh, this is usually uh, going to be in conjunction with this inositol triphosphate or IP3 pathway. Um, you're going to find that calcium is probably even more widely used in cyclic AMP within the body. Uh, it's utilized for neurotransmitters, growth factors, different hormones. Uh, it can be really um, a lot of effects on the endocrine system, such as like insulin and things like that. But um, calcium is also going to be important for causing muscle contraction. So, for instance, if you had no calcium influx into the myocytes, you would have no heartbeat, right? Uh, skeletal muscle doesn't really work that well unless you have calcium influxing into the, the cells. Uh, also good for, like, cell division, things like that. And so uh, this IP3, or inositol triphosphate, is utilized to help mobilize calcium from storage, which we'll show you a picture of that in just a second. So it does this uh, through phospholipase C, which is going to be a membrane-bound receptor um, that actually is activated by another G protein, this GQ protein. Um, basically, once this is activated, phospholipase C goes along and breaks up this molecule. It has this phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-biphosphate. You guys don't have to be able to say that for the test, right? Uh, but basically, what happens is protein... Um, uh, phospholipase C comes and breaks that molecule in half, and so you end up getting IP3 and this diacylglycerol, or DAG, uh, that gets formed here. And those can have uh, strong effects on things like the uh, endoplasmic reticulum uh, or sarcoplasmic reticulum if you're dealing with the muscle and help to regulate uh, calcium release into the cell. So I'll show you a picture of that in a second. So uh, imagine here if you had a GQ uh, protein here that ends up getting activated by whatever signal molecule you have, activation of the G proteins, and that's going to lead uh, to phospholipase C cutting this molecule in half, right? So now we have diacylglycerol which helps to also activate some protein kinases. Uh, but really this inositol triphosphate is important for going down to like, the endoplasmic reticulum and uh, for calcium to be released from there. So we'll look at like calcium concentrations within the cells, um, but a lot of it is actually being sequestered within the endoplasmic reticulum in a lot of cases. Okay, so if you have a molecule that comes along, opens that up, allows calcium to outflow, you have lots of different effects from that. So again, we have multiple different um, pathways here. You can see that um, things like, uh, you know, just looking at the vascular endothelium, um, you can have multiple different types of receptors that can all be affecting different pathways here. So again, it's not only just, okay, only epinephrine affects the beta cells on the vasculature. No, there's lots of different things that can affect that, and they can all uh, interplay with one another. Whether it be things like angiotensin II, which is going to be really important for blood pressure. Um, you have like platelet-derived uh, platelet -derived growth factors. Uh, you have acetylcholine receptors, all kinds of different things. So just know that every cell has multiple uh, receptor types. Some of these things will be synergistic, where they kind of help each other uh, do the same process. Some of them will be antagonistic, uh, just going to depend on, on the tissue type that we're dealing with. Okay. All right. So I'll give you guys a break now. Uh, we'll come back in 10 minutes and then continue on with our dose-response relationships. All right. Any questions from the first half? Pharmacodynamics.
All right, so uh, we're going to talk about now about dose-response relationships. And so essentially what that means is that we're looking at the, the relationship between if I give you this much drug, what's going to happen, right? Um, we can see that in a lot of studies done, this either uh, occurs uh, in individuals, uh, we can look at groups of people, um, or we can look at like specific organs, tissue, cells, sometimes it's done in animals, it just depends on, on what type of study we're doing in order to determine. If I give you X amount of drug, I get Y amount of effect, right? So. Um, we should expect some degree of effect to happen here, and the, the relationship is either, you know, something may be proportional, inversely proportional, we'll look at some of the examples of that. Um, but an effect could be something like lowering blood pressure, or it could be looking at like your uh, depression scores, or it could be looking at things, uh, what are some other examples you guys can think of? Heart rate's a good one. Pain scale could be a good one. Right, so any kind of physiologic effect. Blood sugar, looking at your, um, has ever heard of hemoglobin A1C? What is that? Yeah, it's like average blood glucose over the past three months, right? So, uh, yes, yeah, so we can look at lots of different factors here, but that's some sort of effect that occurs from those drugs. Um, and it's important that we gather this kind of dose-response relationship because um, by looking at this kind of mathematical relationship that signifies uh, that when the drug is working according to the interaction that we think, um, and it's not really working between the other types of molecules. So we'll look at some of the, the delineation there. Because, um, again, um, if every drug was super specific and only affected one type of target, it'd be great because we wouldn't see a ton of side effects. But we're going to see that that's not necessarily always the case. You can have drugs that have uh, poor specificity in a lot of uh, like cases. Um, when you're testing a potential drug, say uh, you guys are uh, an R&D over at Pfizer or uh, some other drug company, um, when you're first kind of checking on a molecule, um, you want to uh, make uh, sure three things are, are, are apparent. One, uh, if the drug isn't there, you shouldn't see any effect. Make, makes pretty good sense there. Um, if you add more drug, especially up to a certain point, um, and you're going to see that there's going to be a plateau effect with every drug, but um, that you should see some kind of incremental change in effect. So again, if I were to give you 10 milligrams of drug X, I see a 10-point drop in your blood pressure. If I give you another 10 milligrams, I see another 10-point drop in your blood pressure, right? So it should be some sort of uh, incremental effect that happens there. And then if I were to take the drug away, you should get back to your baseline state. So if I took all the drug away, eventually once the drug is cleared, you go back to your baseline blood pressure, right? So those are kind of the things that you'll be looking for when they're establishing these dose response relationships. So um, usually you will see these responses uh, shown in curves such as this. Now again, this is a lot of the stuff that's happening behind the scenes before a drug is ever released on the market. So um, clinically, you guys will never have to look at charts like this, but it's important to know the concepts that go into it um, uh, when you are prescribing drugs for people. But basically, you'll see these curves where uh, on the y-axis here, you're going to have response. Uh, this can either be an individual, could be in a group of people, whatever it happens to be. And then you'll typically be looking at the dose uh, that was administered. In a lot of cases, we'll see in y in a second, we use the log of the dose that we're giving there. Okay, But we call this a dose response curve. Okay, What are some of the things you notice about the curve? Okay, so what do you think? What do you think is happening at this plateau effect? Yeah, probably all the receptors are being bound up at that point, right? So absolutely. So again, um, any drug uh, is going to have a plateau effect at some point, right? So once I give enough of it, uh, either the plateau effect is the patient dies, or they've saturated all those receptors beforehand. You typically don't want to get to get to that point, right? We'll look at what that what that point's called in a little bit, but you don't want to you don't want to kill your patients, usually. Okay, um, right, so we can do this for lots of different types of experiments. Uh, the x-axis, again, plotting concentration of the drug, uh, and then the y-axis should be uh, plotting your response or your effect, right? So it could be enzyme activity. Um, we could be looking at accumulation of a secondary messenger, potentially, uh, membrane potential, secretion of, uh, of a hormone, heart rate, all kinds of different things can be our effect that we're looking for. And so uh, some of the terms we're going to use to describe comparing these different uh, curves, uh, first one is going to be ED50, or median effective dose. Okay? Basically what this means is the dose at which 50% of the population or the sample is going to manifest your given effect. Okay, so it would be a case where uh, I'm giving, say, like, you know, 10 milligrams, and maybe I'm only getting uh, a very small percentage of people having effect. At some point, I'm going to get about half of those people having whatever effect I'm looking for. Okay, uh, that is going to be the term ED50, and this is useful because I can compare ED50s between different drugs in order to determine several factors about them, things like affinity, things like potency, all kinds of different things I can look at uh, based on the ED50 comparisons. So uh, I mentioned that usually we're looking at the log of the, the dose that's being given. Um, you can sometimes plot it linearly, especially if you're looking at things like receptor occupancy potentially. Um, but usually we're going to use a semi-logarithmic scale. 
And the reason for that is, is it allows us to look at uh, wide ranges of doses. Um, I can go from something like you know micrograms of a drug all the way up to grams of a drug, and I can compare that uh, pretty easily between different drugs based on, on the dose that we're giving. So that's, that's kind of why we look at the semi-logarithmic scale uh, based on that. And it's easier to estimate those, those ED50s, especially when you're looking at kind of very wide ranges of doses. Because again, we mentioned you know things like you know the fentanyl. We mentioned that as an opioid analgesic. That's dosed to micrograms versus something like you know morphine is dosed to milligrams. And this, uh, we need to be able to compare those two drugs together, uh, kind of apples to apples. Okay, so kind of the four standard parameters that we're looking at if you were to do a dose response relationship say on a person or, or a sample. Um, the baseline response should be at the very bottom. So again, this is where you'd have no receptor occupancy happening at all. So zero effect should be occurring here. Um, your maximum response, which again is gonna be this kind of plateau effect where if I give any more drug, I'm not gonna see any more effect happening, right? So it's the, the maximum I'm able to get. And then this slope here, uh, and what do you think like the slope tells us? Could be how quickly I uh, see my effects. Marginal production of the. Yeah, so how big of an incremental change am I going to see by changing the dose up, right? So, uh, for instance, if I give you 10 milligrams of, of drug A, uh, and uh, say I get you know a 10 point drop in your blood pressure, uh, and I give you 20 milligrams, I see another 10 point drop. That's you know that'd be one slope. If I give you 10 milligrams of drug B, and I saw a 10 mil, um, you know uh, 10 point drop in your blood pressure, and I give you 20 milligrams, now I saw a 100 point drop. That would be a much different slope, right? Um, so again, it's going to be telling you just how quickly or how uh, you know how small of a dose change can affect the response here, right? So things that have a very um, have a very steep slope, um, very small changes in dose can lead to very uh, big changes in effect. If I have a very kind of narrow slope, you're going to see that big changes in dose are required to make any kind of change at all in the effect there. Okay. And so looking at the ED50s, we're going to get half of the maximal effect of concentration, and it should be halfway between the baseline, and what your maximal effect is going to be there. And this is useful for determining potency of a drug. And, and what do we say potency is? How much yeah, exactly. So not necessarily how effective a drug is, it's how much do I need to be effective at a certain range, right? Uh, and so again, we can compare potencies between drugs so that I can get an equal potent dose of fentanyl to morphine, even though the doses are very different, they can cause the same kind of pain relief uh, for a patient. Okay. So with the slope, is it like the steeper the slope, the more potent it is? No, not necessarily. It's just telling you that if I have small changes in dose, I can have big changes in effect. Or if I, if it's a more narrow, a more, um, more shallow slope, um, big changes in dose uh, may cause very little changes in effect. Okay. So how, how is that not the definition of potency? Because potency is going to be when you're looking at as more as a, as a comparative term, right? So it's kind of telling us how far along the left or right of the x-axis do we need to be in order to get those effects. I'll show you some curves here uh, that kind of uh, illustrate that in just a second. So um, when we're looking at the dose response relationships, uh, some of the things we can look at are either going to be a graded response, which is kind of ar um, arithmetic response, um, where um, basically the, it describes the effect of the dose along kind of this, uh, this gradient here. Uh, basically, it's looking at you know changes in blood pressure in regards to uh, have 10 millimeter uh, of mercury drop versus 15 versus 20. Um, usually, what you end up seeing in a lot of other cases are going to be these quantal responses. This is kind of an all or none phenomenon. Um, so for instance, if I were to give you, um, if I was looking at a population, so I was going to give you guys all a drug, um, uh, say like a sedative, right? Um, and so you know, at what point would I get 50% of you guys are asleep versus 50% of you guys that are not, right? So asleep is an all or none kind of phenomenon. You can't be, you know, half asleep. That's gonna be really hard to, to actually measure, right? So in a lot of cases, you're gonna find that, okay, they either had, um, you know, uh, they either had sedation occur or they had pain relief or yes or no kind of responses there. Yeah. It could be uh, trinary, but it, it depends on the, the situation. But anywho, um, as the concentration of the drug increases, we should expect the effect to increase as well, right? Uh, and so you normally we'll find that that response is going to be a continuous relationship, um, and it's going to be dictated by this, uh, this kind of equilibrium here between the drug, the receptor, and this complex is going to form uh, to one another. And again, when I have too much drug and I overwhelm the receptors, that's where I'm going to get my peak effect there, so I'm going to get that uh, the plateau that happens. And so again, with that response with this graded effect, meaning uh, it's going to be continuous and kind of a gradual, where we can look at you know uh, minute changes in whatever factor we're looking at. Uh, and again, the quantal is going to be all or none kind of phenomenon. So I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Okay.
So uh, looking at a graded dose response curves, uh, it should be illustrating the, uh, the relationship between the drug dose, the receptor occupancy, and the magnitude of that effect. We mentioned that not every drug, when it binds to a receptor, gets 100% effect, right? Sometimes you can have partial agonists, sometimes you have full agonists. It depends on the type of drug you're dealing with. Um, so that will dictate kind of how, what the maximal efficacy of a drug can be. And we'll show you some comparisons in just a second. But again, maximum response should be occurring when all the receptors are being occupied, and half max response should be about when 50% of them are being occupied there. So looking at how we can uh, compare these drugs together, again, we mentioned which one's really more important to our um, purposes, potency or efficacy? Yeah, we like uh, efficacy a whole lot better because we can we can adjust our dose, right? So we can we can take into account the potency of a drug and change the dose of, um, uh, as needed. But the efficacy is, is uh, the important thing here. So again, the efficacy is going to be this maximal effect that you're going to be able to get out of this. Uh, potency is going to be basically how far along the left or right of the x-axis uh, that we need in order to achieve that effect. Okay, uh, so it'll be easier to kind of illustrate when we have like uh, some comparator curves uh, to look at there. But this is nice because we can both look at potency and efficacy of the drug um, uh, when you do these kind of responses. Again, potency, usually referring uh, to milligrams, but again, some drugs will be in grams, some will be in micrograms, need to produce a, an apparent effect. It could be pain relief, could be blood pressure lowering, could be all kinds of different things. Um, and then looking at the drug's effects can be valued based on the, the efficacy and looking at the potency. So we can kind of compare that and contrast those between different drugs. Okay, so basically looking at here, you're looking at, say, potentially three different drugs uh, that are being compared to one another. Um, so if you were to look at this, where do you think um, the ED50, do you think uh, it'll be uh, different between any of these drugs? If you're looking at these curves? The ED50 is essentially the same, so like basically you're seeing the same kind of effect here, but the, the potency is really what's differing, right? Because the maximal efficacy isn't really changing between these drugs. They all have the same kind of plateau effect. It just determines how much drug we need to actually achieve uh, that ED50. So for instance, if I need less drug in order to get the, the same effect, you're going to be seeing a, a more potent drug, right? So I can give less drug to get the same kind of effect out of this, right? So their efficacy is equal uh, between these three drugs, but the potency is different. Uh, something is less potent, I'm going to need more drug to reach the ED50, and so that'll be what we see like in curve C, okay? But again, these drugs would all be equally efficacious. I could give all three of these to a patient and they should see the same effect. It just depends on what dose I have to give them to achieve that, right? So drug A, I would have to give less drug. Drug C, I'd have to give more drug. So this is a good uh, kind of ranking of the potency of these uh, drugs. So say you have four different molecules here, so A, B, C, and D, and we're looking to see what the uh, the most potent drug would be out of this bunch. Which ones do you guys think would be most potent? Should be A, right? Because it's going to be farther along on the left side of the curve. I have to give less drug to reach my ED50. Okay. Now is that to say is A going to be the most effective drug? It's pretty close. We'll look at that in a second. But yeah, so we would say that A would be the, the most potent. Which one would be the least potent? D, and then uh, what would be like second most potent? D. Yeah, B, right? So again, it's just looking at how far along the left or the right of the, of the x-axis that's lying. So it's pretty easy to determine there. So um, again, looking at the uh, the efficacy itself, um, agonists should only have positive efficacy, right? And we see the antagonists have zero or no efficacy. Okay, so antagonists should be blocking the effects of other agonists from coming and binding it, if it's, you know, especially if it's a competitive antagonist. But uh, basically, we should be seeing really no effect happening there. And so drugs with greater efficacy are going to be more therapeutically beneficial, right? So I want things with more efficacy um, and more than I care about how potent the drug actually is. Um, so for instance here, which one do you think would be the most uh, effective drug? You think C? Probably A or C, right? So I could probably give A or C in order to achieve the same type of efficacy, right? Um, which one would be like least effective? Probably D and B are probably about equally uh, efficacious there. So here you might imagine these would be a uh, partial agonist versus like something like A being like a full agonist, A and C being full agonist there, right? Which one would be the most potent? A. Yeah, probably A, right? So A and B are probably kind of equally potent. It's just that because uh, their ED50s are roughly at the same uh, point on the x-axis, it's just that A is a lot more effective drug, okay? Makes sense for everyone so far? Okay. And again, a lot of this has already kind of been done on the back end of this. So you don't really see, you guys aren't going to go to your pharmacopeia and look at, oh, okay, let me look at my dose response curves. You don't really care that. But when you look at your doses for a drug, it may say, like, okay, dose between 10 and uh, 20 milligrams starting out with, with a maximum dose of, say, 80 milligrams for a drug, right? They've already done that response to say, okay, well, you know, usually most people have most of their responses around 10 to 20 milligrams. Some people may need more, 
right? So that's when you can go up to see what your max doses are. And when you get, start getting above that, what do you think happens when you get above max doses? Yeah, so your receptors might be all, all bound up, but this is when we run into more uh, side effects, right? So we'll talk about toxic doses in just a little bit. Um, but again, um, that's why we have max doses, because we see that, okay, there's no additional benefit. Maybe we're binding up all those receptors. We're not getting any additional improvement in whatever effect you're looking at, uh, and you're only going to see more side effects, okay? So that's why every drug uh, can be poisonous, right, in, in the right amount. Okay, so again... Um, the efficacy is just determined by kind of looking at the, the y-axis here. You can compare and contrast. Again, A and C, we said would probably be equally efficacious. It's just A is a more potent drug in, in this case. Again, Emax would be the term we use to consider, um, to talk about the kind of the maximal efficacy we can see for these drugs. Okay. So again, looking at how effective these drugs are, again, A is probably going to be uh, equal to C in this case, um, which would be like kind of the least effective drug. Yeah, D. So D is also the least potent, but also the least effective out of this whole bunch. So even if I give a ton of drug D, I'm never ever going to be able to reach the same kind of uh, max efficacies I could out of drug A or C. Okay, just uh, uh, how it interacts with that receptor or how much it activates, it's just never going to be able to, to exceed that. Okay. So then uh, looking at affinity and intrinsic activities, so this is important for determining um, how uh, large our ED50 is going to be for these different drugs. So um, basically um, the affinity for the, the receptor, and we mentioned affinity before, what is that? How strongly it binds to the receptor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so how, how strongly the, the molecule is going to bind to that receptor. So higher affinity, stronger binding uh, to that receptor. Think about like a clingy significant other, right? So if you have someone who's like just constantly calling you up and blowing up your phone when you're at school, um, they might be have strong affinity for you, right? <laughs> <laughs> Not that I'm experiencing that or anything. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, so again, drugs action is going to be affected by both the quantity of drug that reaches the receptor, uh, and also going to be that degree of attraction. So how much affinity that receptor has for the um, the, the drug, and vice versa. And again, uh, the amount of drug that reaches the receptor. How do you? What, what kind of things could affect that? Do you think? Hmm. Okay, yeah, so if you have something else blocking the receptor, that could affect how much drug is affecting it, yeah. That could, that could affect your efficacy. Okay. Yep, so you can see upper down regulation. So if I have fewer receptors, I have less uh, ability to activate that and I have less efficacy. That'd be one thing. Think of... Go ahead. Yeah, so what, what could affect that? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, essentially, yeah. So if I were to get something orally and it has a lot of um, metabolism that happens in the liver and not a lot of drug gets to the bloodstream, um, not a lot of it's going to get the receptor, right? Versus if I were to give a drug um, intravenously, all of it's going to be able to get to the receptor potentially. So again, think about different things like that that affects uh, how much drug can actually get to the receptor to have its effect. You can have something at a super high affinity, uh, but if it can't reach the receptor, it doesn't matter because it's not going to be effective. Okay, and then when we're talking about intrinsic activity, so again, this has nothing to do with how tightly the molecule binds to the receptor, but it has to do with how much activation actually occurs here. Um, so you can have full agonists, you can have partial agonists, and then also in some small cases, you can have like uh, inverse agonists. We don't see those clinically all that too often. Um, antagonists, though, really for the most part should have no intrinsic activity. It should just prevent other things from activating that receptor, right? So you should see not necessarily a negative effect. So um, for instance, if I were to give... Um, I think of a good example. So, for instance, if you had a drug that was an antihypertensive, so lower blood pressure, if I were to give an antagonist to that drug, it wouldn't necessarily raise your blood pressure higher than what it would be at baseline, right? It would just kind of reach you back to what your baseline would be otherwise. So, you think about it like that. So, again, antagonist, no intrinsic activity. So, uh, moving on uh, from those graded responses, looking at a quantal dose response. So, again, this is going to be looking at um, populations, typically, uh, looking at groups of people uh, or animals or whatever it happens to be, uh, and usually it's going to be the all or none response. So, I mentioned, like, sleep uh, is usually, like, a, a good example of that. So, if I were to give you guys, uh, if I were to pump a gas into this room uh, that the knocks some of you guys out, some of you guys may think that's already happening. Uh, based on your, your sleepiness, um, you know, the point at which I have half of you guys asleep uh, would be my ED50, right? The other half of you guys would be uh, hopefully running out of the room. Uh, I know everyone's asleep, but thank you. Right, so this should be the desired effect or defined effect within 50% of the subjects. So anesthesia is a really good example of this. Again, sleep, yes. Awake, yes. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of an um, all or none kind of effect. Okay. 
So that ED50 in this case would be the uh, the point at which 50% of the subject experienced whatever effect it's going to be. Um, another good example would be, um, say, like uh, if you had a certain threshold for an effect. So, for instance, if I had like a scale for depression, say it was like a 1 out of 10 scale, um, and, I, and I had the percentage of people that, you know, once I have 50% of the people, I have a three point improvement, right? That could be uh, kind of one of these um, uh, uh, graded effects, right? Um, and so, again, by comparing that, we have an ability to look at, you know, more apples to apples between different drugs by looking at where the ED50s lie. Uh, the other thing we'll look at is going to be the toxic median dose. Uh, so this is going to be the 50% uh, mark at which a population exhibits a given toxic effect. So what could some of these toxic effects be, do you think? Like vomiting could be a toxic effect. You have, um, say, for instance, like with blood pressure, if I drop your blood pressure too low, um, you can see like dizziness or falls. Like that could be another thing we could be looking at. And then finally, if you're meeting a lethal dose, which would be at the point which you have 50% of your subjects die off, right? The other group is probably going to have um, uh, you know, toxic effects, but the other group is going to die off, essentially. Um, so how often do you think we're looking at this with people? It's probably unethical to do uh, studies where you're comparing lethal yeah, dose, but we can do it with animals. Sorry, animals, um, for the betterment of humankind, right? Um, so we can probably look at that and do some extrapolation uh, into to what people. Now, in some cases, you can see what like an LD50 would be for a given drug based on looking at things like case reports and looking at things like, because um, like, we know what a lethal dose of like caffeine is, right? Because we've seen enough case reports where we know that if we give this much, you should see uh, someone. There's actually a website you can go to. Uh, it's called Death by Caffeine. Uh, you can actually put in your favorite caffeinated drink and it tells you how much you'd have to drink in order to uh, off yourself. Um, <laughs> Also, yeah, metabolism. Yeah, lots, lots of different factors go into it, but it's, it's a fun website to, to look to see how much, you know, how many Red Bulls you'd have to actually consume. Yeah. Yeah, you're in PA school, so you, you'll probably be riding close to that mark uh, pretty frequently. Right, so uh, and every drug is going to have uh, each of these uh, factors here. So you're going to have ED50, TD50s, and LD50s based on um, whatever therapeutic effect you're looking for, whatever toxic effects you're looking for, uh, and lethal effects. Okay, And so the spacing between these curves is really, really important for determining how safe a drug is. Right. Um, so for instance, looking at your therapeutic effect, how much space do you want to have between the toxic effect and the lethal effects? Yeah, you want to have as much space as possible, right? And so we're going to call this our therapeutic index, right? And so basically it's going to be a ratio between either looking at our lethal effect or a toxic effect and how that compares up to the therapeutic effect. And so you'll find drugs that I can give you. Um, so a good example of this would be antidepressants, right? Um, back in the day, we have to use uh, old school drugs like amitriptyline. Still see that used uh, occasionally clinically. It's a very dangerous drug. If I were to say take say five times uh, my normal dose of amitriptyline, um, I can expect to see some very significant um, uh, negative effects. Someone could die from that, right? On the other hand, if I were to give you say a newer type of antidepressant like an SSRI, like Prozac, um, the therapeutic index is huge on that. If I take five-fold overdose. I'm not going to die from that. If I take a tenfold overdose, probably not going to die from that, right? Um, and so some drugs are very, very safe and have a very wide margin of um, uh, safety. Some are very, very narrow, right? And if you think about like you know a depressed person, what are they at risk for? Suicide. Suicide. Like why do you want to give them a bunch of drugs that are going to make them more uh, you know easier to, to overdose on, right? So that was a problem we ran into a lot uh, back before the SSRIs came out. So you'd have these patients who were depressed. Um, they'd take these antidepressants and then they realize, oh, I can just take a bunch of these and then you know off myself. Versus the newer ones where they could take huge overdoses of SSRIs and have no problems for the most part. Um, so this is something we run into very commonly in, in, in the tox world. Not to give you guys like any um, happy thoughts or anything. So. Right. Um, so again, looking at our um, toxic effects, we can look, look at these comparisons here. We can do uh, these ratios to determine uh, how safe a drug is and compare that to one another to determine what this therapeutic index is going to be. Um, so usually you'll see a therapeutic index either listed as having the LD50 divided by the ED50, right? So a bigger number is going to be better, right? Because that means there's a bigger ratio there. The toxic dose is way, way far off uh, versus if I had a very uh, small ratio, if I had, you know, say, um, say only a ratio of 10 versus a ratio of 100, the drug that is a ratio of 10 would be much less safe because that, that ratio is much closer together uh, between the toxic or lethal dose and the effective dose. Also, another term we could use for this is the margin of safety. And so looking at this, if you were to look at, say, a person getting their, their effective dose of morphine, right? So we're looking for analgesic effect or pain relief. Um, this would be the point where about 50% of people are having their therapeutic effects, right? Now, when you dose a drug, are you hoping for a 50-50 chance of the person getting the response you want? 
Yeah, you'd, you'd like better odds than that, right? You'd probably like to have like 98% of your, your patients getting effective pain relief from that drug, something like that. So if I were to start to creep up my dose here to, in order to capture more people to get that therapeutic effect, I'm getting closer and closer to my uh, toxic dose, right? And at a certain point where I get too high on this uh, curve, um, then you're starting to certainly get on, onto this toxic curve. And that's where you can see problems like respiratory depression and other issues like that. Um, so again, we like a, a larger margin of safety. The larger, the better in most cases. Okay. Um, again, therapeutic index is just going to be calculated by dividing their uh, therapeutic dose, I'm sorry, toxic dose or lethal dose divided by that uh, effective dose 50. Okay. And again, this way you can compare drugs. So something like uh, amitriptyline, that old school uh, um, antidepressant drug, they only have like, you know, uh, a therapeutic index, say a five versus like an SSRI, SSRI might be like 500. Okay. So being able to compare those two together is very useful because I can say, well, my patient's at high risk for suicide. I'm going to give them something with a much uh, higher safety margin uh, than someone who's maybe is low risk for suicide. Okay. Okay, so mission of the therapeutic index is going to be that ratio there. Obviously, bigger is better. Okay, um, so another good example of this would be uh, two drugs. So uh, diazepam. Does anyone know what diazepam is? Valium is the brand name for it. What do you use it for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can use it for seizures. You can use it for anxiety. This is one of those drugs that helps GABA to work a lot better, right? So we mentioned that being an inhibitory neurotransmitter. But um, this one is pretty pretty forgiving, right? I have a therapeutic index uh, of 100 there. I mean, I would, you know, before... So say, for instance, we're comparing the lethal dose 50 to uh, the effective dose 50. I would have to have a 100-fold overdose to really even get to a point where 50% of people would hit uh, would, would be lethal for them, right? And so we always say, like, diazepam is, like, the only way you can die from, like, a, an overdose just from these drugs is if you get hit by the truck delivering it, right? Very hard to do. Versus something like digoxin, we mentioned that's affecting um, electrolyte uh, flow within the cardiac myocytes, right? Um, this is leading to uh, therapeutic index of only 2 to 3. Very small changes in, in dose can lead to very drastic effects on, on patients, right? So it lead to arrhythmias, lead to death, all kinds of bad things. So just keep in mind that every drug's gonna be a little different and you'll get a feel over time for what the safety margin is uh, for a drug, right? Especially within a given class. Um, for instance, like, you know, I know that if I'm giving someone an antihypertensive, I know ACE inhibitors, pretty safe for the most part. Beta blockers, a little less safe. And you'll learn what type of patients are gonna be good candidates for those drugs based on the type of um, their propensity for having those kind of toxic effects, right? So I have a really old patient who's more prone to falls and things. Well, I don't want to give them something that could lead to uh, more dizziness and orthostatic hypotension. And you get a feel for what type of drugs will do that, right? And of course, everyone's going to be a little different. So some people will manifest toxic doses earlier or later than others, depending on uh, their propensity to, uh, you know, genetic makeup and, and all kinds of different factors. Um, but that's why we look at populations, right? So that way, at least get kind of an average. Um, so we term drugs have a, a small therapeutic index to be narrow therapeutic index drugs. Um, and so we will say, so digoxin is a really good example of a narrow therapeutic index drug, um, where even small changes of dose uh, can lead to big toxic effects or potentially lethal effects. Um, and so generally, uh, we uh, will use narrow therapeutic drugs. Uh, we like to use them as... as infrequently as possible. But when we have to, that's when we can do things like measuring blood levels of the drug to make sure we're staying within a certain range. And so over time, you'll have um, an idea of based on, um, you know, for instance, like digoxin has a very narrow therapeutic index. I can look at a patient's blood level and they have to be between 0.8 and 1.2 nanograms per ml, right? So that's not a whole lot of change there. And if little things like their renal function changes or they take an extra dose because they're older and they, they forget they had a dose, um, things like that can, can lead them to either go way out of that range the toxicity, or they may go under that and then leading to, to less efficacy and can have uh, heart problems, right? So just be aware that if we're doing like drug levels uh, for a uh, drug, usually it's because it's a narrow therapeutic index drug, okay? Okay, so we'll talk more about uh, therapeutic drug monitoring later on in the class, and we'll have a whole section kind of just based on that. That's where your, your local pharmacist will, is going to come into play in helping you to make sure you're uh, dosing your patients appropriately. Um, other good ones uh, that we do this uh, very frequently for include things like phenytoin. It's an anti-epileptic. We use it for, for seizures. I uh, notice here we want to keep it in a range of 10 to 20 micrograms per ml, right? If you go too low than that, what, what do you think happens? You have seizure, right? If you go too high above that, then we see too much depression of the CNS, and you see a lot of uh, dizziness, see a lot of falls, a lot of sleepiness associated with that. Um, so that's why you want to keep that in the narrow range. Uh, I mentioned phenobarbital or being a barbiturate. Uh, it's another ther narrow therapeutic index drug. Um, lithium, do you guys know what you use lithium for? Yeah, bipolar disorder is a big place you use lithium for. You guys know what lithium used to be? Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it. Do you guys know what, what food product lithium used to be in? Yeah. 
Seven up, yeah. So seven up used to be uh, lithiated uh, for a period of time there. Um, yeah, and so some other drugs. We mentioned methotrexate being used for things like um, cancer or like rheumatoid arthritis. That's pretty near therapeutic index. Um, yeah, so lots of different drugs are out there. You can, we like to avoid these drugs when we can, but in a lot of cases you have to use them because it's, it's maybe the only effective drug for that condition. Okay, and again, just kind of showing you graphically the comparison between a narrow therapeutic index drug versus some of the large therapeutic index. Um, compare something like warfarin. You guys know what warfarin's for? Yeah, it's a blood thinner, right? So we use it for to prevent clots. Uh, you know what animal we use it to kill? Yeah, it's a, it's a rodenticide, uh, so it actually kills off rats um, or mice and, and other little rodents and things. Uh, but essentially, um, we use that for people too to help them prevent uh, developing blood clots and things. And so this one is a narrow therapeutic index. This is where we actually we don't measure blood levels of the drug. We actually measure a different thing called INR. You guys familiar with that? And basically, it's a measure of how quickly or, or slowly your blood is clotting off. And so uh, we can measure that and determine how much drug effect we have and keep them within a narrow range. This would be something where uh, if you had, you know, changes in dose or changes in diet in a lot of cases with the warfarin, um, you can get to unwanted adverse effects pretty easily. So for that one, it'd be bleeding and be the, the major um, clinical thing we're worried about. On the other hand, you have something like penicillin, which penicillin is for? See if anyone said like syphilis off the bat, and I'll be like, okay. Mm. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, right, so uh, lots of different infections we can use uh, penicillin for. Uh, some STIs are having to be one of those. Um, but yeah, so we have a much wider therapeutic index. So someone could take a couple, a double dose, triple dose of penicillin, and they still don't even get close to the unwanted adverse effects. Depends on what the, the, the criteria for that is. You know, things like diarrhea happen at, you know, fairly, uh, can happen at therapeutic doses. But we may be looking at things like, you know, thrombocytopenia or other more clinically significant consequences there. And so this is, all goes back to our, what our definitions for what the toxic dose is or lethal dose happens to be. Okay. So again, uh, we'll use uh, both quantile and dose response curves to help us uh, compare drugs to one another to look for uh, potency and efficacy between drugs. Um, again, most of the time we're looking at semi-logarithmic plots, mainly because that allows us to look at a wide range of doses comparing to one another. Uh, and it's really providing kind of really uh, critical information to help us make better therapeutic decisions. Again, you guys won't be looking at curves or looking at dose response things, but when you look at a dose and a drug reference, uh, most of the time that's taking into account a lot of these different effects, right? Okay. So uh, why do people have variation in, in drug responses? Why can't I give one drug to one person, they have a great time with it, uh, the other person has a really bad time with it? What do you think that is? Hmm? Could be metabolism, right? So if we have too little or too much metabolism, that may make a drug less or more effective. Yes, yeah, so we have drug-drug interactions, or maybe one's making uh, drugs less effective or too effective. Patient compliance, yeah, that could be definitely one thing. So they're not taking the drug, they're probably not going to see much of an effect, right? What else is wrong with them? Okay, what else is wrong with them? They, got, they have SARS, right? Something ain't right syndrome, maybe that's it. <laughs> um, yeah, so if they have other disease states, that could definitely be affecting uh, how well a drug may or may not be working, right? So lots of different things that go into it. Um, but yeah, pharmacogenetics can be a big a factor as well. So again, if they're producing too many or too little of a, a drug metabolizing enzyme, or if they have too few or too um, uh, many receptors, they're being uh, expressed on the cell surface. Lots of different things can go into this. Um, and so it's important that you guys take into account those factors uh, to make sure you can predict who's going to have a good response to this, right? So we're going to talk about some of these uh, uh, kind of variants in how a patient responds to a drug. So we're talking about idiosyncratic responses. Um, we're talking about tolerance and tachyphylaxis. Tachyphylaxis is one of my more favorite medical terms. Um, and then the kind of hyper or hypo reactive responses that a patient can have and reasons for that. So idiosyncratic responses, um, these are pretty rare uh, for the most part, uh, and they're kind of an abnormal response to a drug. And basically, we can look at the mechanism of drug. You can look to see like, this blocks beta receptors or this affects uh, this enzyme, uh, but the response that you're seeing doesn't really match up with that, right? So the mechanism does not belie with the type of response you're seeing with that. Um, in a lot of cases, it's not really an allergic response we're talking about, um, you know, true actual immune system mediated response. A lot of times it's going to be uh, other things. And you can't reproduce it regularity, right? So I can give 100 people a drug, maybe only one person out of that uh, has that response, or I can give it to a million people, only like four people have that response. It can be pretty rare in a lot of cases. Um, and these responses, it may, may or may not be dose dependent. Sometimes people just happen to have a, um, a uh, proclivity towards having a reaction regardless of how much of the drug is around, uh, but sometimes it could be dose related. 
And again, um, most of the time you're going to see this can occur due to genetic predisposition. So whether they have like an altered um, drug receptor site or altered metabolism, something like that is usually one of the reasons why a person may be at risk for developing one of these reactions. So a good example of this would be uh, mentioned before that uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. Remember, I was talking about G6PD deficiencies. Um, the drug uh, primaquine is kind of an old school malaria drug. If I were to give this to a person, uh, they don't. They lack this enzyme, and they're not able to deal with the the oxidative stress that this drug can cause, which can lead to hemolysis and hemolytic anemia. Right? Um, you guys know what food they, G6PD deficient patients can't eat? Yeah, it's called it favaism, uh, or they can't have fava beans. Right? So, like Hannibal Lecter was not uh, deficient in G6PD. Right? So, anyway, but you can have patients who are, um, you know, just a little bit deficient in G6PD. Some patients can maybe be completely deficient, right? So uh, it can range based on the type of mutation you're looking at. Um, and, and this is why you look up these, these responses, right? That's why you look um, these kind of things up. So for instance, if I have a patient who comes into the ER and they say, hey, just by the way, I have a G6PD deficiency. I have to look that up every time. I look up what type of drugs they can or cannot receive. Um, look at their history about what type of drugs they've had before and what type of responses they had. Um, I have to look at that stuff every time, right? you don't run into these cases very frequently, uh, but that's why it's important to take a second, step back, and look it up. Okay. That'll actually be the number one takeaway thing from this class and all my classes. If you're not sure, look it up, right? Okay. Because, uh, again, the lawyers are going to, uh, you know, if they ever came to your doorstep, they'd be like, well, why'd you do this? And you'd be like, um, I wasn't sure. No, you said, I look it up, and that's what it told me to do. No. Anyway. Um, so hypo or hyperreactive responses, so this is basically the intensity of, of an effect that a patient receives after a given drug. Um, so for instance, if I have something like uh, diphenhydramine or Benadryl, right, what do we use Benadryl for? Allergic reactions, what else can you use it for? Put it in your No, don't put it. Okay, so actually, <laughs> okay, listen. Having a one-year-old, uh, I will say when she had a cold and could not breathe uh, at nighttime, we did give her some Benadryl therapeutically. Um, There's actually a case where parents were actually sent to jail just recently. They were actually giving um, their kids full-strength adult dose uh, Benadryl, uh, gave it to like an eight-month-old, and, and find the patient dead in the morning, right? Um, be very careful with uh, Benadryl in, in some cases. Usually a very safe drug, but anyway, uh, just to put a downer on the situation but um right you, you mentioned we could use it for sleep that's a that's an uh, that's an adverse effect that's a that's a side effect of uh, benadryl is that it makes you sleepy because when you're taking it for your allergies do you want to be conked out the rest of the day probably not right so if you guys are having allergies this morning you take a benadryl um you're going to be sleepy the rest of the day you're not gonna be able to you know retain this information um you know it's not not good but in some cases when you want to go to sleep benadryl is a great drug for that so it just depends. Actually, in uh, some patients, you can actually see excitation after giving Benadryl. So uh, especially in kids, you'll have what we call a paradoxical reaction where you give it to them and they get super hyper and they're bouncing off the walls. Um, they uh, have that due to, uh, you know, they have a little bit different um, metabolism. Their, their, their CNS is not fully developed yet. They can end up having paradoxical responses to it. Okay. So just be aware some patients may be uh, predisposed, certain patient populations to, to one adverse effect or another. Another good example, I don't know if I mentioned this one or not, but opioid pain medications. Um, we had some patients, uh, not us personally, but uh, nationally, um, we do not recommend the drug codeine anymore. Okay, Codeine being uh, what type of drug? Do you guys know? Did, did I mention this example already? Yeah, yeah so it's an opioid. Uh, what does it get converted into? Yeah, so you'd have these patients who had obstructive sleep apnea before, uh, young kids, uh, would go and they do a TNA and take out the tonsils uh, and, and adenoids, uh, and then again, after surgery, their, their throat's swollen, uh, they're taking this drug and they, they're, they have too much of this 2D6 enzyme around, they convert too much over to morphine, they get respiratory depression, uh, and, and you know, just having that kind of obstructed airway does not help the situation, so there's some deaths associated with that, and so we do not recommend codeine for kids anymore. Okay, so that'd be a case where you know this uh, whole drug is just taken off of the you know uh, the the armamentarium for utilizing this patient population due to these effects that we know about. Again, that's going to be uh, a genetic predisposition. So patients, I believe it's of African descent and then also Middle Eastern descent. I believe uh, those tend to be the ultra rapid metabolizers and are more likely to uh, produce uh, more morphine. Which is interesting because um, you guys are familiar with sickle cell disease. What type of patients are more prone to get sickle cell? Mediterranean Jewish, but also like African American patients. Um, they act, we usually put them on for pain control codeine, and that makes sense because they're more prone to have those enzymes. They get a lot more morphine out of it. They get a lot of good pain control. Okay, so again, it kind of goes back to those things where like you may have been uh, dosing or giving a drug, uh, and not realizing why you were doing it and why your patients were responding so well to it, but there could be a reason for that. In fact, looking at their genetics, so something to think about.
Um, so tolerance, what is tolerance to a drug? Mm -hmm. Yeah, essentially your body gets used to it, right? So again, we mentioned body likes homeostasis. We like to stay in the state of, of kind of just neutrality, right? So if I were to give a drug and I tip the scale one way, the body's going to try to compensate for that with other mechanisms to get you back to baseline, right? So for instance, if I were to give you a drug that lowers your blood pressure, your body's going to respond to that because like the, the kidneys are noticing less pressure, so they're going to say, let's get more antidiuretic hormones, let's get more aldosterone, they're going to try to bring the things back to, to normal. And so in order to get back to that original effect, you have to give more, more drug, right? So uh, again, you have to continue to increase the dose in order to achieve the same effect. And so what, um, what are some good examples of drugs that develop a lot of tolerance to them? Opioids are a huge one, right? That's what leads us to having the opioid epidemic that we're in right now because patients, especially that have poor pain response, they're kind of self-medicating themselves with opioids. You have to keep ramping up their dose in order to achieve the same effect. And again, stimulants are a big one. Um, so, for instance, caffeine. Um, how many of you uh, drink so much caffeine on a regular basis that um, hitting something like a Red Bull uh, really has no effect on you? Yeah, there's probably a few of you, right? Um, I would go into severe withdrawals if I uh, stopped my caffeine intake. So it doesn't do anything for me. It just keeps me regular at this point, right? <laughs> Not necessarily the most healthy place to be, but that's where I'm at. So <laughs> everyone's journey is a little different. Right, but in order to uh, get that, if I were to slam, say, like, three or four Red Bulls, that would probably be enough caffeine to get that response, right? So, again, this tolerance can be overcome by increasing the dose enough. So uh, there's a different type of tolerance that occurs called tachyphylaxis. Um, and so this is going to be when uh, you get to a point where the body, it uh, doesn't matter how much I increase the dose, I can never overcome that no matter how much drug I give. Okay, um, This can happen after the first dose for, for a small number of medications. Uh, and again, no matter how much I increase my dose, no extra response is going to be seen here. A lot of times this is due to the fact that you're wearing out the body's uh, system for responding to that drug. So whether it be certain cofactors or enzymes or neurotransmitters, uh, you basically get to a point where you get no extra response. So a good example of this is amphetamines, right? Um, what type of clinical syndromes do we give amphetamines for? ADHD, yeah, is going to be one of the big places where you see a lot of amphetamines being used. But say you had someone who's using it recreationally. Uh, I just had a newspaper article uh, my family member sent to me. Uh, my hometown, there's a big drug bus, and they uh, bust like five people I went to school with, high school with, uh, in their homemade meth lab. Um, but these people, <laughs> they use a lot of methamphetamines, right? Their, their dentition obviously uh, kind of told you that. But... Essentially, um, amphetamines work by spitting out neurotransmitters, especially catecholamines like epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine is a big one. Um, and so it causes neurotransmitters just to be sent out at an increased rate. Well, does your neurons, do they have kind of an infinite supply of those catecholamines? No, you're going to wear it out at some point. So even though I keep increasing my dose of amphetamines, if I don't give my body a chance to, res or to kind of um, reset itself, give it time without the amphetamines around, uh, I'm going to get to a point where it doesn't matter how much I increase my doses, no extra effects is going to be seen there. Okay, That's why I have to give your body a rest in some cases in order to kind of restore those neurotransmitters, restore those pathways to have effect again. The other really good example of this is going to be nitroglycerin. Okay, You'll realize that when you have patients who are on um, long-acting nitroglycerin-based products, um, that they always recommend having 12 hours on, 12 hours off. Okay, So think about the nitroglycerin patches or paste. You can't leave them on 24-7 because of the fact that if I do that, I'm going to start to deplete all those that cyclic GMP pathway, that nitric oxide pathway. You end up depleting that, so that way when you actually really do have chest pain, you put a patch on or you put a sublingual nitroglycerin tablet in your mouth, no extra effect is seen there. Okay. So that's why if you ever see a drug that's like 12 hours on, 12 hours off, that's why it is, is do that tachyphylaxis. Okay. Um, so again, other uh, reasons that a patient could have a variation in, in drug response, uh, they have an alteration of drug concentration that reaches the receptor. Okay. So for instance, if I have something that prevents metabolism of drug, I'm going to get more drug at that receptor. Or if I have something that um, inhibits metabolism, or I'm sorry, if I have something that induces metabolism of a drug, more of it's being metabolized more quickly, less drug gets to the receptor. Okay, so you can have kind of um, larger or smaller variation in response there. Uh, it could be due to endogenous lichen concentration, so especially um, if I'm having something where my body's compensating by releasing more of the ligand, uh, say I have like a, an antagonist sitting on the receptor, the body wants that receptor to be activated, I can release more ligand to try to overcome that receptor or to overcome that antagonist. It could be one way to do it. Um, we mentioned downregulation, upregulation of receptors. That's another way we can affect our response there. And then also looking at kind of downstream responses to that. So changing things like secondary messengers, uh, either downregulating or upregulating them, um, changing gene transcription, things like that can also affect your response to a drug.
Okay, so lots of variations there, and we'll talk about more specific examples when we get to actual drugs, uh, when we get to pharmacology. Right? Okay, so uh, again, some more uh, detail on these uh, different variations here. So looking at the, um, the alterations in drug reaching the receptors, a lot of this is going back to the pharmacokinetic factors, right? And we said pharmacokinetics is what? Yeah, what, what does the body do to the drug, right? Those are, that's what the kinetics are. So um, this can be things where you can have absorption, distribution, metabolism, or excretion changes uh, that can affect how, much, how the drug sticks around. So one of the big ways you see this is going to be upregulation of hepatic enzymes. So for instance, a drug called carbamazepine, we use this very frequently for seizures and also for bipolar disorder. Um, if you give the same drug of carbamazepine, or same dose of carbamazepine over a long period of time, you're going to see the patient has less and less response to it. The reason that is because their liver enzymes are starting to upregulate and metabolizing that drug more quickly. Right? It's kind of recognized as a toxin, wants to get rid of it, so it upregulates. In order to overcome that, what would I have to do? give more drug, right? So I can give more drug, give a bigger dose to overcome that. And so you'll find that if you look like at a dosing <coughs> regimen for carbamazepine, you'll see that uh, it'll say start at like say 200 milligrams uh, a day and then gradually increase it up to say 600 milligrams over two weeks, right? So those are sometimes why you see dosing recommendations like that where they gradually increase is to overcome things like this um, metabolism induction. Um, other factors that can affect this include things like changes in age, gender, weight, disease states, all that can lead to changes in either um, how the drug is uh, distributed, how the drug is metabolized, all factors like that. There's still a plateau effect that occurs, so like there's only so much induction my liver enzymes can do. Yeah, so once I hit that, then I'm kind of at a nice steady state. Yep. Absolutely. Um, other things that can occur, so you have these things like uh, multi-drug resistant genes. Um, these are really important for uh, drug uh, transporters, and actually they're efflux pumps uh, that will uh, try to prevent drugs from getting absorbed to the GI tract. They'll spin them back out to the GI tract and prevent absorption. Um, sometimes you can see upregulation of that. Um, I guess ever heard of the, the grapefruit interaction? Right, so you tell patients with certain drugs, watch out for drinking grapefruit. They can actually affect these uh, MDR proteins and prevent them from working effectively. And so you get way more drug in your system than you think otherwise uh, lead to toxicity. Right, so uh, we'll talk about those kind of specific drug interactions when we get to those drugs. Um, but just be aware that things like that can occur. Um, so again, you can have variations in the endogenous ligand concentration. So propranolol, which is a beta blocker, is a really good example of this. Mainly, um, this drug works by blocking adrenergic beta receptors. So normally what epinephrine or norepinephrine would bind to, um, this blocks that, right? So it's against an antagonist, no intrinsic activity of those receptors. Normally, uh, if you're in a state where you are at a high amount of epinephrine is being released, so say for instance, like um, uh, you're about to give a, a big speech, right? So if I called one of you guys up here right now to Tell me about, uh, I don't know, the cyclic AMP pathway. Um, would you have a lot of epinephrine in your system or a little bit? Probably releasing a lot of it, right? That flight or flight, fight or flight response. In which case, I could give you a beta blocker like propranolol, and that would actually help to deal with that performance anxiety, right? So this is why we sometimes will give beta blockers uh, for like musicians or people who are giving speeches. Um, we'll give them beta blockers to prevent that response. Uh, from having all that extra epinephrine, right? That way they're not sweating as much, they have less tremors, they're, they're a little bit more, uh, can be a little more eloquent, right? So, um, but if you're in a state where you don't have a lot of epinephrine, like me, I'm used to talking to you guys, um, I don't have a lot of epinephrine floating around right now for that purpose, give me a beta blocker, it's not really going to do a whole lot for me, right? So all of that goes back to how much endogenous ligand, the epinephrine you had floating around in the first place. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, ma'am. Um, safer is a relative term, but for instance, um, another drug I give for anxiety would be something like uh, uh, benzodiazepine, right? So like the Valium or the diazepam. Um, one of the big side effects you see from those drugs is going to be increased lethargy and sleepiness, right? So if I need to get up here and, and talk to you guys for, say, like six hours in a day, um, I probably don't want to be super sleepy for that. Right? But if I had a beta blocker who's just kind of dealing with those kind of epinephrine effects, um, just you know, kind of dealing with the sweating and the tremor and all that, that, that would be preferable. Okay? So it just depends on the side effect profile and kind of what's better for, for your patient. Right? Um, some patients, they may just be used to having that benzodiazepine around, and again, they get tolerant to those effects. Um, they may be fine with just that drug, if they're, especially if they're taking it very frequently. Right? Um, but in cases like this, like stage fright, uh, it's usually like a very specific like, um, situation that's coming up. I only need to take it for that one situation, then I'm done with the drug. Um, that's better when you just need it for a short period of time. 
And again, you'll learn this stuff as you go on. Like you'll learn, like, okay, my patient needs it for this particular situation. Here's what their disease states are. Here's what other drugs are on. This might be the best option for them, right? Mm -hmm. Some patients you would never want to give them a beta blocker because of they're, they're asthmatic or they have other reasons why they, they shouldn't be on it. Um, it just depends on, on your patient. Yep. So you guys will learn that over time. I was actually really salty when I was in pharmacy school because we had a class called pharmacotherapy uh, where basically you're sitting in a group and uh, there's like 50 of us or so in our in our class uh, up in Jacksonville uh, and they would uh, you'd have a case uh, that you had beforehand and they would call you on you uh, you had to stand up and they ask you very specific questions about the like, guidelines it's like what is you know what you know the this trial what type of patients were they looking at when they gave them this drug and what happened and uh, so you know called at random it was very nerve-wracking, right? So I get up there, and I'm like, oh, it's uh, said, and then you blank, and then you get a bad grade, right? Um, I did other people in class that were taking, you know, beta blockers beforehand, and they did great. I was like, it's performance-enhancing drugs they're utilizing there. <laughs> I never succumbed to it, though. Caffeine is still my only drug of, uh, of choice uh, during school. Anywho. <laughs> So uh, some other things that can happen. Uh, we can change the, the number of the function uh, of receptors uh, that can bind to our drugs. Um, this can lead to either increases or decreases in, in receptors. Um, you can sometimes see this being in response to uh, certain hormones. Uh, so for instance, if, uh, if you imagine someone who has like hypothyroidism, they don't have enough thyroid hormone, kind of what, what do they look like? Yeah, so they have some weight gain. What kind of, what's their energy level like? They're tired, and they're kind of cold, like they don't have enough of those adrenergic receptors um, that get stimulated by things like thyroxin. Um, so uh, if you were to give them more thyroid hormone, all of a sudden those receptors start to upregulate, and they kind of have a better response to things like epinephrine, right? So that can alter your drug response in, in certain cases. And we mentioned tachyphylaxis as well, kind of exhausting those certain pathways to where it doesn't matter how much drug I give, still not going to get any additional response. That's why it's important to look at your dosing to see like, okay, does this drug need to be on for 12 hours and off for 12 and, and vice versa? Um, there's also a, a term called desensitization, where if we're giving kind of repeated or continuous uh, administration of a drug, either agonist or antagonist, um, you can see changes in responsiveness to the receptor over time. Um, and so this can uh, basically is, is your body's a way to try to prevent damage, right? Because if you have too much stimulation of certain pathways, it can lead to cell cell damage and cell death. And so by desensitizing themselves, either by down regulating receptors or changing the conformation so that maybe they're not being bound quite so much, uh, it can lead to kind of um, uh, less drug response. Uh, but better cell health uh, in the long run. It's another way we can try to uh, minimize actual drug response over a period of time. And so uh, even if I give, continue to give more and more drug, eventually you're going to get that state called tachyphylaxis where you kind of run out of that, uh, that pathway. Um, so even though the receptors may still be there, uh, in a lot of cases, you're going to find they're just going to be unresponsive over time. This is why we, sometimes with drugs, we have to give breaks off of them. Because then once you take them away, the body can then resensitize those receptors and then you're back in, in business, essentially. Okay, um, let's see. Okay, so let me just finish this section and then I'll, I'll let you guys go for a break. Um, but again, uh, so for instance, we're looking at certain receptors, uh, especially like the voltage-gated um, ion channels, right? So we'll, we'll talk about when we get to action potentials, how some uh, of these channels are going to have refractory periods, uh, where basically we don't want to have too many action potentials, especially like in myocytes and stuff. You have too many action potentials going on, you're developing a rhythm and you die, right? We don't want that. Um, so we end up having certain of these uh, cells, we end up having a refractory period. So for instance, if I activate it, uh, if I try to go and activate it too soon, uh, it doesn't matter how big of a response I, I try to send to that cell, uh, it's never going to, it's not going to send off another action potential until it has a chance to reset itself. Once it does, then I can go ahead and get full effect out of it again. Um, so for instance here, if I were to give something like uh, epinephrine, uh, you can see that I get you know, full response the first time I give it. If I were to give another dose of the drug within a few minutes, I may get a diminished response out of that. But if I were to give them a few hours, something like that, then I'm resensitized to it again and I get the full effect uh, once again. So we'll talk about refractory periods, especially when you get to the cardiac section and how that's uh, is very protective to prevent against things like uh, arrhythmias. Okay, uh, I will let you guys go on break now. We'll come back in 10 minutes and then start our physio section. Any any questions before I let you guys go? All right, see you in, oh yes. Um, no, I think I'm going 2.30 to 4.30. We did not talk about switching yet. Yep, okay.